Our first reading comes today from 1 Corinthians 15. Last week we read from 1 Corinthians 15, but it was from the end of the chapter. Now I'm going to those verses which precede it, starting with verse 35. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. And to each kind of seed is its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. From Psalm 26, we read this word, these words. May they be true of us. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. Proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And then from the gospel reading today, we continue with Luke chapter 24 and we start with verse 13. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood, stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified by him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, he had, that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Christ interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that very same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those that, who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has now appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he is known to them in the breaking of the bread. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord, speak to us by your Holy Spirit through these scriptures that we might know your word, that we might know that you are speaking to the church, that we might know that you are speaking to us, your sons and daughters. We ask that you would speak to us according to our need, that this word would be prophetic 
and it sends that it would find us where we are and would bring us to where you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There had been reports of an empty tomb. An empty tomb. There had been reports, words spoken by those who had gone to the tomb that Jesus was alive. But who can believe those kind of things? On that first day of the week, the women of the group had gone to the tomb and had seen that the body was gone. And then they had talked to what, what seemed to be angels. Jesus, for certain, was no longer there in the tomb. Uh, those angels said, listen, those angels said he was alive. That we should have anticipated this. Peter gone, had gone to investigate he went to look, and he looked into the tomb, and there was no body. And he was amazed at what he had seen. And then it seems as if at some point Peter had had a, a meeting with the Lord too. He, he said that the Lord was risen. See, it's interesting that those who knew Jesus best thought that the testimony of this, these women, according to what it said last week, remember, that the testimony of this, these women is, is just an, idol's te an idle tale, an imagination. It's foolishness. It doesn't make sense. It can't be. Maybe what Peter said to them, I, I, I think to myself, uh, maybe what Peter said to them led them to wonder, but... But let's be very clear. The disciples weren't at the point of believing. They didn't believe what is being told to them. Certainly Christ may not be in the tomb. His body may be in the tomb. But there is no way that he could be alive. Those, were, those very thoughts, those very beliefs, those very words spoken by Thomas, his disciple, those who knew him best, right? In one way, it makes sense. No one comes back from the dead. No one. No one had ever arisen and come back alive after being dead. Not for three days. It never happens. Listen to me. To believe <clears throat> takes a change of mind and a change of heart. We are so immersed in this world that we live in that it's hard to think beyond, beyond this. It's hard to get our mind beyond what is uh, tangible. It's hard to perceive anything beyond what we can touch or see or taste or feel. To believe anything beyond what we have known before requires something more than what we have. It takes revelation. Take rev and to receive revelation takes faith. Revelation and faith. Only with revelation can we experience the reality of heaven and the kingdom of God which has come to earth. Only with revelation. See, and by revelation, what I mean, it, I mean this, it takes an intentional act of God to show himself to an individual for that person to believe. To believe that Jesus has risen from the dead, one has to experience Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? It has to be personal. You have to experience Jesus to believe that Jesus is alive. That same day, the two followers of Christ are, are walking to Emmaus. They've got to get out of town. Jerusalem, all that happened there is weighing heavy upon their hearts, and they've they got to get out of town. And, 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 you know, you can see that they're grieving as they walk, and, and they're walking down this road seven miles to this village to get away from all that. And as they're walking, they are doing what friends do. 
They're talking and ministering to one another. They're listening to their grief. They're expressing their grief just as they should. And along comes this stranger and says, hey, what are you talking about? You know, what's your conversation? You know, I, I'm interested. And immediately, you can see their grief. Immediately, they stop. And in their sadness, they stop still. And they ask him, have you not heard all that has happened in Jerusalem? And they begin to describe the crucifixion and the passion and all that Christ had gone through. And then they come to the point and says, and some in our group, the women in our group, had gone to the tomb. They couldn't find the body. And they're saying that they saw two angels. Those angels said he had arisen. And, 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 and Peter, too, went and, and said, had an experience, but... Here we are on the road to Emmaus, and our hearts are broken, and we don't know what to do, we don't know what to say, we don't know what to think, so we're just getting out of town. Right at that point, this stranger is walking with them, reprimands them, and calls them foolish. And he begins teaching them from the scripture, starting with Moses, going, starting with the law and going through the prophets and teaching them all that Jesus had suffered, what it was for, and all that he had promised, what that was for. That he had died for them and that certainly he would arise for them. He also reminded them that Christ said he would die and then arise on the third day. Confirming, listen, confirming the testimony they had heard before. See, that's what's happening. These men are more like, I don't want to be disrespectful of them, but this is the best that I can do. They're more like fans of Christ rather than believers. You see, Jesus was someone they rooted for. They wanted him to win. They wanted him to desperately to win, to become the king, to reassert their sovereignty over their own nation. They wanted Jesus to win, but he lost. Now the season's over. Listen, the cross made it clear. The season's over. And evil had won. Now, here's this stranger telling them that the season's not over, that a new season is just beginning, and that the most important victory of all time took place at that cross. Upon hearing this, I think these men, their hearts begin to open up to good news. They begin to respond. And they're, they're, they begin to feel something in their souls because they were made to feel it. These men are made to respond, just like you are. They are made to respond to the good news, to the God that created them. So as they come to that village of Emmaus, uh, this stranger acts like he's going to go on, but, but, but they beg him. They beg him. One who administered to their grief in ways no one else could. They beg him to stay with them. And, and since it was evening, the stranger went in with them and they began to eat. And then as the stranger received the bread and he broke bread and he blessed it, just like he did on the Last Supper, right? They recognize him. They see him. They have a revelation of him, a personal experience of the risen Christ, that he truly is risen. <laughs> and they had just walked seven miles, but guess what? They ran seven more, all the way back to Jerusalem <laughs> to tell them the disciples, those fans who are now believers, had ran and told those, those disciples who were still fans they ran to tell him, indeed, the Lord is risen. We have seen him. 
You see, it takes revelation. It takes the Lord God himself because of the nature of what we were created for, what God had always intended you for. It takes a personal experience of God, a personal experience of Jesus in order to know Jesus, in order to believe Jesus and trust him with your life. Now, what I want to do is for a few minutes, pause the story. We're almost at the end of the story, but I want to pause it. I want to talk about us. I, I want you to understand this. None of us come to believe without an experience or revelation of God. You could have grown up in church your whole life, gone to every Sunday school, heard every lesson, but without a personal experience of God, you will live your life as a fan rather than a believer. Now, there are a million different ways. Can I tell you what the difference, uh, I, real quick, you know what the difference of a fan and a believer is? Fans never get out of the, out of the seats. They never get out of their seats. They just watch and applaud. That's it. But a believer gets in the game. They're invited to participate in life. Not only do they cheer for life, but they're invited to get into the game, into the, into the tussle, into the struggle, into the victory. They're invited to participate in the life of God rather than just to cheer from the sidelines. That's the difference. None of us can become a believer without having a personal revelation of Christ. You could have grown up in Christ and church your whole life, but unless you've had this, you will not become a believer. Now, there are a million different ways God may reveal himself through his son, but to believe, we have to have that that revelation, God must come and show himself to you, must reveal himself to you. You need to experience Christ. And there's a million different ways that God can do this in your life. My experience is going to be different than Tana's experience, than Charles' experience, than Stephen's experience. Our, our, my experience is different than my children's experience. But God must come and you have a personal meeting with him. An experience, a revelation. That can happen through the scripture. It can happen through a prayer. It can happen through a dream. It can happen through many different ways. But you must have that personal revelation in order to become a believer. The second thing is this. We should not be surprised when we share the gospel in our testimony. Uh, and it simply does not make sense to someone, to others. Why? Because they need revelation too. You see? Now that does not mean, and so there may be people who utterly reject you when you share with them. There may be others that say that's interesting, um, but that's not me. But we should not, in any sense of the way, uh, decide that we're not going to share our testimony because, you know, they, they're not there yet. Or we're not going to share our testimony. Or we're not going to pull back on our preaching because it serves no purpose. That's not true. It opens the person and prepares them for the revelation that is coming. Uh, with me, my own life, I remember very, very distinctly the time I came to faith in Jesus Christ. I had a friend when I was in middle school. Uh, I had a friend and he told me that he was being baptized and that um, and I, I didn't understand how a person could be baptized if they weren't a baby, because that was our tradition and not his. And so I asked him about it, and he goes, well, I got saved. And I go, saved from what? I didn't know. And, um, and I had gone to church my whole life. I had. But I did not understand what he was saying. And he began to share with me the gospel, and I went home. And I asked my mom and dad. I went, then went from the, the testimony of my friend Robert. I took it 
to my parents who are the authority in my life, the spiritual authority in my life. And I remember my dad telling me very distinctly, everything Robert's told you is the truth. You have to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I didn't know at that time that when three months earlier, he had given his heart to the Lord. But he confirmed, and he was a man of integrity, and he was a man of love, and he was a man that I trusted. And so I began going to church with open eyes. I began listening to to what was being preached, and it sounded different. And I began noticing the love between people that were at church. It wasn't just a social thing. There was something more. And then my mom, my mom, she heard about this man who was preaching in this Methodist church in the middle of Littleton, Colorado, and she took me to him, and I heard three nights in a row, I heard the word being preached as I'd never heard it before. It was preached with power. It was preached with the Holy Spirit. And at the third night, no one had ever gone up. He made an altar call Monday. No one came up. Made an altar call Tuesday. No one came out. Made an altar call Wednesday. I went up. And um, first it was just me. Pretty soon there was 30 other people up there. And um, I was shaking like I am now. But when I stood up before that altar, I had an experience of Jesus Christ. When I prayed, I knew that Jesus was real. I hadn't, I could never, I never did grab a hold of him like this. But there was something in my mind, in my heart, that was forever changed, and I experienced him. And it was such a quiet, um, peaceful, uh, real thing. But it was something that I couldn't grab a hold of. It's something I couldn't couldn't understand. I had a revelation that Jesus loved me, and that He forgave me. And I had a revelation that I would never, ever, ever, ever be the same. I was in seventh grade when that happened. My life has never, there's never been a week I haven't bent my knee to the Lord. There's never been a time, there have been times when I've been messed up. There have been times when I've not lived right, where I haven't spoken right for him. But I am his child. And I am a believer. I'm not a fan. I'm in the game. I'm working for his kingdom. You see, so the third thing I want to say about revelation is this. The revelation we see from God is a revelation of himself. It's not some special knowledge. It's a special person. It is God, the creator and God, the redeemer that reveals himself. God, the Holy Spirit that reveals himself. He reveals himself. And it's very interesting that the, the picture of revealing in scripture is of a person that is literally disrobing themselves and coming honestly before another person. It is very intimate and it is very connected to who we are as men and women, who we are as people. For God wants to come and uh, be soul to soul with us, heart to heart. He wants that intimacy that is mirrored in a, in a relationship between a godly man and a godly woman in a very, very real sense, because in that, we have the image of God. What is that? Look, I already know that my words are be twisted, but what is that is a revealing of heart to heart to one another. When Adam and Eve, when they, when they broke God's, I shouldn't say it like that, when they broke God's law, Adam and Eve, okay? What is the first thing they did? They hid themselves, right? You see, and a revelation is exactly opposite of that. It's God saying, I'm not hiding myself any longer. This is who I am. Come and know me. Come and know me. Amen. And that's what we're called to do with one another, both friends and and especially husband and wife, that's what we're called to come and know each other and to love each other uh, with all of our flaws, right? Just as we are. Isn't that true? That's what God has called us to. The 
It's a revelation of who he is. And in the end, I think that revelation, when we see Christ and we see God for the first time, it, it, it disorients you, doesn't it? Because we are oriented to see things according to the world, but all of a sudden we see God and we say, hey, this world, it's secondary to him. He's the one who really gives me my meaning. He's the one who determines what this is about. He's the one who, who gives work purpose. He's the one who gives family purpose and love and joy. He's the one who created everything, and it all leads back to him, you see? So when we come and we understand that the revelation is him, that changes everything. Everything is seen anew, and that's disorienting at first. Uh, one of my favorite songs is a song by Phil Joel. It's a Christian song, and he wrote it when he... When he at a, a time in his life when he was going through some really hard things, and it, it's just called change. And it, the whole thing is there's one part where he just kind of, and it's a rock and roll song, so he's really energetic. But he, he talks about how knowing Christ changed everything from the way he wears his wedding ring to the way he hugs his daughter. Changes everything. From the way he works to the way he plays. It changes everything. When you see the revelation of who Jesus is, it changes how you live. It changes how you think. It should change how we speak. It should change even how we vote. That's right. It should change how we, how we love one another. How we spend our money. It should change us. Changes everything. Because everything is seen anew. There is a new reality and our living cannot go in, the, go in the same way. Our view of the world has been transformed because we are transformed. It's a new perspective of understanding everything that is. And understanding that sees Christ as supreme over creation. Colossians chapters 1 and 2 makes that very clear. The fourth thing I want to say, I should say supreme over creation, even death, right? Yeah. So, number four, fourth thing about revelation. This revelation never leaves us. It's an ever-abiding understanding and vision of who Jesus Christ is. But it is also progressive throughout our lives. This revelation grows with us. See, there are two disciples on the road, right? And, and they have listened to Christ over the years and have given their hearts to listening and they're fans and they're cheering Jesus and, 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 and their hearts are prepared, but they don't, they don't believe yet. And so uh, when Jesus comes and he breaks the bread and he blesses it, they recognize him for who he is. He is the resurrected Son of God sitting right in front of us. And he has just spent hours explaining the whole mystery of his grace. See, they've had a revelation. Their eyes were open and they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us as he spoke to us on the way? while he was explaining all the scriptures to us. You see, they experienced a progression of revelation that day, that day they heard, they tasted, and they saw. Often in our lives, the experience of our knowing God is like that. We hear the word, and so we come to church, and then we taste his presence, because there's a special presence when the people of God worship. And, and then... And then we, we, we somehow, someplace, somewhere, we cry out to God and, and, and we perceive God and in in Christ in a way that, that is personal, that grabs us. You see, I had a friend who went to jail. He was smuggling drugs from Mexico into the United States. He had been a Vietnam veteran and had learned how to fly helicopters and airplanes in the Air Force. And, and in Vietnam. And so when he came back, he was addicted and he was also very, very ambitious. And so he wanted to make money, went to Mexico, loaded up a plane, was successful at it for a while, got
got caught by the federal government, got thrown into a federal prison. And there he picked up a book written by Charles Colson called Born Again. And he read that book and it opened up new possibilities in his thinking. He put it down and he began to read the word. He's a very, very smart man. And he read the word and all of a sudden he was seeing what he had read different than what he had heard before. He started going to church within prison and, and, and he noticed that there was something more about the guys who went to church and, and there was something more that was happening there than what was just surface level. There was something spiritual. And so his heart was open to God and he was, he was becoming a fan of God and began to root Jesus on, began going to church and, and everything. But then one night he had a dream where uh, he couldn't move. He was standing upright, but he was stiff as a board. And he said, I couldn't move. I couldn't get away. And I saw Jesus on the horizon, and I kept on moving towards him and moving towards him and moving towards him until I was within his reach. And then he just grabbed me and pulled me in. And then I woke up, and he goes, I was a different man because I had had a revelation of the personal Christ and what he meant. And I knew that he loved me and he forgave me. I can remember that night he shared with me his testimony. My experience was different. It wasn't like that. Your experience may be different. Maybe the experience that you will have will be different still. God can lead us into an experience with the risen Lord in so many different ways. We may have a vision. We may have a dream. We may just may have a, a, a warm, assuring uh, feeling of the presence of God. But we will know. You will know when God reveals himself intentionally to you through his son, Jesus Christ. But that's not the end, is it? It's not the end. For the revelation persists, still persists. It will always persist. Even beyond the grave, it will persist in my life. Through scripture, through prayer, through obedience, it's persisting even now. More and more, I want to tell you something. More and more, I've come to the realization, everything is becoming new. God will make everything new. Listen to me. He's doing that even now in your life. When I first started here at this church, a little before, actually just a few months before, I had this moment where um, God took my wife and took my son and had them visit Colorado without me. And um, I, you know, there's a weakness of mine. If Tana's not, if Tana's not in my bed, I have a hard time sleeping. It's just the way it is. I, I can't explain it. It's like, you know, our kids are telling us to get a king size bed. I go, no, I want that bed. <laughs> it's small. She's always within reach, you know. And um, I think Tana would say sometimes, yeah, I wish we had a little bigger bed. But, we do. You know. So I couldn't sleep. She was gone. I couldn't sleep, so I went to the... Uh, I went to my favorite donut store. <laughs> I started... They had good coffee in the middle of the night. Um, and I was there about 2 in the morning. And um, I started writing down. I remember the Lord telling me, he says, tell me what you want from your life. And I started writing down. I wrote down three things. And the first thing was this. I go, I want my marriage to be a symbol of hope for those who are struggling in their marriage. Yeah. I want people to look at us and see us honestly for when we're having troubles, we're having troubles, I don't care. But let them see us and be encouraged that, hey, marriage is worth it. And I want to go that direction. If God's in the middle of it, there's something good there. I wrote that down. The second thing I wrote down was um, 
I want our ministry, our service to the Lord, to be fruitful while we're here, but I want it to be a hundred times more fruitful through my children. And then I, then I wrote down this, Lord, give me one town, give me one city, give me one community that I can give my life to. I don't want to spend my life in 10 different places. I want to go one place. I want to put my roots down and I want my life to matter there. I want God to change that place where I live there. You know, one place. Uh, and I think God is, I think God has honored my praying. I still pray that prayer. I still think that he's honored that prayer. Dana and I are entering into a new season, a new life, a new revelation. God has started speaking to me 10 years ago about what he wanted to do with this church. And immediately I started praying that God would raise up a holy people. I didn't understand that that, that would mean a, a shaking of the bush. and uh, 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 I didn't understand that it would mean a, a trimming of the head to the you know, uh, cutting back the way it meant both in my life and in the life of this church. But I got to tell you that the fruitfulness that I see in your lives uh, makes me happy that I prayed and asked for that. About six years ago, Tain and I, about five years ago, Tain and I, we went to the denomination and we, we spoke to them and we said, look, we're we're at a place, our church has so much potential and we're at a place where my energy is getting less. I'm still bivocational. I can't do what I used to do. And the church is, is getting smaller. We're not growing. Uh, you know, things have changed in the community and I'm not sure I'm quite the fit. And, and the, the man who was our pastor looked at me and he said, um, looked at me and Tana and he said, um, Mike, why are you in Atalanto anyways? And I said, because I, I was called there. He goes, right, you were called there. And it's obvious you were called there because of the years you put in. No one stays in that place unless you're called. He goes, how many people do you think are called to Atalanto now? And I go, I don't know. That's not my job, that's yours, you know? And he goes, I don't have any who are begging to go into Atalanto. I have a whole bunch begging to go to Orange County, but none to Atlanta. And so my response to him was, I understand that, but isn't it your job to call them? You see, because if you call them, they'll hear. Some of us are here today because we are called to this community. And we've been called to this church and you've been faithful. And you were beautiful before the Lord. Tane and I, he asked us to stay with the church for five more years. And, and we did. We stayed there for five years with the Lord. But now things have changed some because um, my work at school, they're, they're um, making it hard for me not to retire. Um, and so I have to retire for the sake of it just makes sense. It's the right thing, and it's the right time. And I see God's hand in it, but it's outward circumstance, so I have to retire. And um, and the Lord made it really clear to me and my wife that if we were to write, retire from school, we were going to retire from this church. And so our last Sunday will be June 6th this year. It hurts me to say that but I must tell you that the Lord has assured me that this is a new season a new time not just for Adelanto Foursquare Church but for 
for my wife and I cannot tell you the love that I have for this place. And I will forever pray for this place because of the great impact it had upon my, my family, my wife, and I. God knows the sacrifices that we made here. God also loves this church even more than I do. And so he has that man and that woman chosen, ordained, selected, and empowered to bring forth a new season here. And I don't, I, you know, I would not encourage you to, to be despondent, but I would encourage you to see this as a, a turning of the page that the Lord has something good. We've been praying for something good. Ten years ago, this is the truth, I had a dream where uh, I was leading a whole bunch of little kids down Santa Monica Boulevard. They're all on tricycles. And we're all, we're all screaming for Jesus. And we're headed towards the beach where the pier is. And we're, we're, we're all headed there and, and we're all celebrating Christ and I'm leading them. And, and I get down to the beach and I see this, this big barn and I know it's the church. And so I lead these, these children to the church and we go and you see these children, they look like, you know, like ants crawling all over the building and everything. And I go inside and I see this big fire, <coughs> this big pile of wood. And the Lord tells me, he tells me, light the fire. And so I do, I, I light the fire and immediately I wake up and I said, and I remember telling the Lord immediately at that point, I said, Lord, I want to see the fire. And he goes, it's not your job to see the fire. It was your job to light the fire. And so the Lord gave me one city and I'm here for a few more weeks. The Lord gave me one city. He was faithful. He's faithful. The Lord gave me one wife. And I, you know I love her. And I hope that, I believe with all my heart that he has used our marriage to speak hope to others. I believe it. I believe the Lord is calling us now to a new time where I'll be called to minister to my children in a special way that they might rise up themselves and serve the Lord. And so in obedience, I cannot stay. Though it hurts to say that, I cannot stay. Dane and I love you very much. And 33 years, man. Come up here, please. Nope. I can't force it this time. Will you pray with me? Father, in your name, we're smack dab in the middle of your will. We're exactly where we should be, this time and place. Lord, I bless your holy name for Al Hato. I bless your holy name for, for your presence here, for the prayers that have taken place in this room and by these people. I bless your holy name. I ask, Lord, that you would come and, Lord, that you would do your <coughs> mighty, mighty will, that there would be a, 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 a reordering, yes, a, re, a re, renovation, yes, a, a revitalization, yes, of your church here in this place. Lord, we pray for the pastors to come. We ask that you begin speaking to them and let them hear the call to come to those who are needy, who want, who need to hear the gospel. Lord, let them have energy. Let them be full of your life. Let them listen to your Holy Spirit. Let them, Lord, tend to your will. 
the Lord may the may the service of prayer that has always resided in this church may continue and become a huge bonfire of hope and light here in this community. Father, I thank you for the ways that you have loved us. And I thank you for the way you love this place. How you've been faithful to us in all these years, all these moments. And even today, Lord, we're thankful. We thank you that your revelation never leaves us. But the revelation of who you are abides with us and grows within us day by day. Blessed be your name, your holy name. Blessed be the Son of our God, who is Jesus Christ. Blessed be his Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we say it. Amen. Amen.